wouldn't it be nice to have several thought leaders in your industry know and love your brand? Start a podcast. Invite your industry's thought leaders to be guests on your show and start reaping the benefits of having a network full of industry influencers. Learn more at sweetfishmedia.com. You're listening to the B2B Growth Show, a podcast dedicated to helping B2B executives achieve explosive growth. Whether you're looking for techniques and strategies or tools and resources, you've come to the right place. I'm Jonathan Green. And I'm James Carberry. Let's get it into the show. Welcome back to the B2B Growth Show. We are here today with Jason Gaynard. He is the founder of MastermindTalks.com, and he's also the host of a really incredible podcast called Community Made. Jason, how are you doing today? Good, man. Thank you for having me. I'm stoked to chat with you. I read your book, Mastermind Dinners, uh, a few weeks ago. I think I, I read it in like an hour. It was a very easy read, but incredibly tactical, practical. Uh, and I've actually already planned, I think, six Mastermind Dinners throughout 2018 so far, I think between now and April, and plan to do a lot more. So the book, incredibly inspirational for me. Uh, and, and I wanted to bring you on and, and have you talk to, to our listeners about it. But before we talk about mastermind dinners, I'd love for you to just explain to our listeners a little bit more context around what you're doing with mastermind talks. Uh, and then a little bit about your, your podcast as well, community made. Yeah, sure. So, uh, mastermind talks is a invite only event and community for entrepreneurs. Um, since our inception in 2013, we've had just over 16,000 entrepreneurs apply for an event that's capped at 150 people annually. It's a very, yeah, it's a very eclectic group of people, and it's, it's, I guess, very exclusive. Uh, so we do a three-day gathering once a year, and so that's that takes up the majority of my year when it comes to to planning that. And oddly enough, um, that event, the whole notion of that event, stemmed from me doing these dinners first, and then it evolved into. Uh, that annual gathering. And then Community Made is basically a podcast I I released probably about five months ago where I kind of challenge the notion of self-made, I guess you could say. And uh, each uh, each season is themed. So season one was all about scale, um, where I shared my own views on scaling business and also brought in other guests who, who shared different views on scale. Uh, and season two, which is the season I'm working on right now, is all about how to grow uh, amplify and deepen, uh, your business relationships. So I love it. Awesome, Jason. So I'd love to spend the rest of our our time together in this interview talking about mastermind dinners, which you, you wrote a book on. So if you, uh, if, if this is interesting to you at all, go to Amazon and and check out Jason's book. It's a very quick read and, and super helpful, but at a, at a high level, Jason, tell us a little bit more mastermind about mastermind dinners at a high level, kind of why you're so passionate about them. Yeah. I mean, basically for me, I was, uh, I, I built a very successful, like a seven figure business, uh, but realized after being an entrepreneur for, for about seven years, I built a business I hated to enable me to buy things I didn't need to impress people I didn't like. So I decided to scale that business down to zero. And unfortunately two things landed me a quarter million dollars in debt when the dust settled. I didn't know what I was going to do next, uh, but a friend of mine posted to Facebook that they had a, a ticket to go see Seth Godin in, in New York. And I've always been a, been a bit, big fan of Seth's work, so I decided to jump at the opportunity and didn't know what it was about. And it turns out the theme of it was the connection economy and how there's huge value connecting like-minded individuals. So I ran with that idea and started Mastermind Dinners where I'd invite eight entrepreneurs out for dinner with the core focus of connecting them. And the first one I did, I almost canceled two hours prior because I'm like, nobody's going to see value in this. They're going to think I completely wasted their time. But thankfully, it turned out to be a big success. The conversation didn't skip a beat for four and a half hours. And I got clarity that connecting people was something I wanted to do to some capacity for the rest of my life. Not necessarily as a business because I wasn't um, monetizing these dinners. I was paying for them out of pocket, which people thought was crazy at the time. But for me, being a quarter million dollars in debt, I was seriously considering bankruptcy. So I I re- the real way I rationalized with it was that the bank could take my car, they could take whatever measly assets I have left, but they can't take my relationships. So investing my relationships was the safest investment I could make. And since then, I've, I've and that was in 2012 is when I started the dinners. I've easily hosted thousands of entrepreneurs at these dinners over the year. I'm, I'm doing one next week, actually, where I'm buying out a restaurant. We'll have 90 entrepreneurs in attendance. Wow. 
And to me, it's like the highest ROI activity I can do both from a fulfillment perspective and from a, a business development perspective as well. So Jason, that's, I mean, I didn't realize that you, the scale at which you'd, you'd been hosting these and the number of people that you'd hosted. Sure. When you're organizing these, there were some, there were some tips in the book as far as kind of where, obviously being, you know, very intentional with, with who you're choosing to in, invite to the event. So I'll start there. But how do you think about when you're putting these together, who to invite to a mastermind dinner? Yeah, so I mean, you, you usually the the baseline uh, is that they want to they have to be somebody I want to have dinner with in the first place. <laughs> Meeting yep. they have to be uh, interesting or fascinating on some level. You know that that gut test for me uh, serves as a great filter to eliminate those that maybe you know they may be successful on paper, but they may be egotistical or maybe you don't want to you just wouldn't want to spend time with them ultimately. So that's kind of my my gut test, but really where the dinner shines, I guess you could say, and where a lot of the hard work is done in advance is connecting people who share uncommon commonalities because the stronger the uncommon commonality, the stronger the bond. So um, if you put a bunch of entrepreneurs together in a room, statistically, like 3% of people, if I were to go out, walk outside with you in the major city and we stopped a thousand people, statistically 3% of those people would be entrepreneurs. So if you find yourself at a dinner with 30 entrepreneurs, that's a pretty rare opportunity. And in that setting, you're most likely going to hit it off with those individuals because they, they have very similar values to you. Oftentimes they, you know, they have, they put blood, sweat, and tears into the work they do. With that said, though, if your business does seven figures, then 0.4% of, of entrepreneurs fall within that category. So if you're at a dinner with seven-figure entrepreneurs, that's an even stronger uncommon commonality. That's an even stronger bond, ultimately. So that's one of the kind of the, the key factors when I'm looking to do a, a dinner. Generally, I'm trying to connect people who are like-minded, who are relatively at the same level of, of business, um, who probably have the same goals, the same struggles, uh, the same fears and those kind of things. And, you know, outside the context of business it doesn't have to be about business at all. It could be an uncommon commonality it could be everybody is parents or everybody, you know, formerly served in the military, but ultimately you, uh, the stronger, again, the stronger, the uncommon commonality, the, the easier those relationships will form. Okay. So, so you, you also talked in the book, Jason, about, the the art of kind of choosing choosing the location. What goes into thinking through? Kind of, okay, where do you actually want to host this dinner? Yeah, I mean, it's a couple of things. I mean, for me, there's 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 different variables. Like for me, uh, the big dinner I'm doing for for ninety people, it's it's a full restaurant kind of buyout, and that's a rare occurrence. The majority of dinners I do, I tend to cap them at about six people. Uh, it just serves to be a, a really good size group. I've done significantly bigger dinners, obviously. But if you do anything above eight people at a single table, uh, conversation can be fragmented. And oftentimes there'll be two conversations going on at once and it's hard to focus. And sometimes you'll overhear what other people are talking about. And you're like, shoot, I wish I was part of that conversation instead. Um, so a little bit of FOMO in there. So uh, for me, six is an ideal size. So finding a place that is is intimate and relatively quiet that can accommodate six at a table. I mean, the, the format of the table doesn't necessarily, uh, or the layout of the table doesn't matter as much when you're at a group of six. And the types of restaurant, I mean, it, it depends for me. I try to find something um, that is usually pretty good with people's dietary restrictions. So stuff like Mexican food, oftentimes, you know, those who are paleo or keto or, or vegetarian usually can all, uh, find something on a Mexican food kind of menu. Um, sometimes steakhouses fall within that category. Um, but being very conscious of people's dietary restrictions is a, is a big factor as well. So yeah, somewhere nice, somewhere intimate, somewhere relatively quiet. And for me, again, the the magic number for for a dinner generally is is six people. Okay, so so one other, what, you know, one tip that I that I pulled away from the book was the concept of planning these dinners around conferences where you know that uh, you know people are going to be traveling to the conference so they're not going to have kind of the regularity of their schedule of you know getting uh, Susie to soccer practice or you know piano lessons for their yeah. son or whatever. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to us a little bit more about kind of 
you've obviously done both. You've done them in, in the kind of the regular schedule being in someone's you know city, but then you've also done them at conferences. Talk to us a, a little bit more about that. Yeah. So I've, I've done them locally. And, and to what you said, the, the problem with local dinners is that you run into friction with people's schedules. Um, they already have commitments, whether that be taking their kids to some kind of sporting events or date nights or you know, business or whatever the case may be, when you're able to leverage an event. Um, so when people are flying in for an event, for example, very rarely is there anything planned in the evenings. So I will try to be basically that catalyst and make a reservation. And during the event itself, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, you know, connect with people and say, if I hit it off with them, I'll say, you know, by the way, I'm not sure what you have planned tonight, but, you know, we have dinner reservations at seven with a small group if you want to join us. And most oftentimes those people don't have any, uh, I mean, the, getting, knowing where they're going to eat is generally an afterthought. So yeah. if you can be that catalyst to, you know, set that up, um, you'll most often get a, a positive response. And I've even done that with speakers for events as well. And it's, it's incredibly easy to get speakers out at, the, at these dinners because they need to eat. Um, and oftentimes they haven't thought of where they're going to eat. So if you can solve that problem for them, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an easy yes. Are you planning the dinners that you're doing around conferences? So there's not a lot of advanced planning necessarily asking people, you know, prior to them even leaving for the conference, hey, we're doing this dinner on Wednesday night. You're, you're just kind of meeting people throughout the conference and, and knowing like, okay, I've got, I've got six spots to fill throughout the day. I'm going to invite, you know, seven or eight different people knowing that six of them are going to show up. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, it depends on the, the event. Some events will provide like a guest, uh, like a attendee list in advance. And if that's the case, then you can look through that attendee list and, and, and kind of uh, pinpoint those that you want to invite out to the dinner and do it in advance. And then you can do it properly as far as like getting people's dietary restrictions and sending calendar in, invites and all that kind of stuff. But even if you have to do it on the fly, it's generally surprisingly easy to, to get people to to agree to come out to a dinner. So for me, it's it's not uncommon for me to go to an event and have lunch reservations for every day and dinner reservations for every day. And as I meet people, uh, I'll invite them out uh, for either lunch or dinner. And then once you're, when you're in these dinners, Jason, do you have any, any thoughts on kind of how to, how to guide the conversation? Are there, you know, questions that you like to ask that tend to generate pretty cool conversations? How do you think about that? I, I don't, in, so the lead into a dinner, um, I mean, context matters generally, but if I'm the one putting it on, um, usually I'll start the dinner or, or lunch or whatever experience for that matter and, and state why they're there, like why I'm putting this on, why I invited them to dinner. Uh, and then I will go around the table and introduce everybody. So I won't let them do it themselves because oftentimes people are either terrible at introducing themselves because they get nervous and they just, you know, ramble on, or maybe they're very humble and undersell themselves. Um, so I try to basically be, be their biggest fan and introduce everybody at the table. Uh, then after that, we'll go right into our meals now, again, if there's a strong, uncommon commonality amongst everybody, they'll naturally hit it off. I've never had a problem at a dinner. I also do assigned seating to ensure that like, I stack the cards in my favor because naturally you'll see some – you'll know one person. You're like, oh, he'll really get along with this person or, oh, these two people are in the same industry or whatever the case. So I'll generally do assigned seating but not always, especially if it's a group of six. You don't have to worry as much because there will only be one conversation at a time generally at a dinner table. But when you deal with larger dinners, that's when you'll have to start doing assigned seating if you really want to um, still have that, that – high level of experience and then I'll, I'll let them go through the dinner and then at the end of the dinner uh, I do three things to kind of close off the dinner which works well and I've never actually I didn't share this in mastermind dinners because it's more of a kind of recent concept but what I'll do is at that point I'll get people to share or to answer three questions one uh, question number one is if we were to meet a year from today with a bottle of champagne what are we celebrating and that gives you a great idea. Because when you ask people, like, you know, what are you excited about or what are your goals? Sometimes you go, I mean, the quality of your questions will determine the quality of your answers. So a question like that, for some reason, yields great responses. And then let's say somebody says, uh, you know, I want to hit the New York Times list. I'm coming out with a book. The follow-up question to that is, in order to hit the New York Times list and, or in order to achieve that, what is something you need to solve or overcome? 
Uh, so you have a clear understanding of what their goals are and a clear understanding of maybe some obstacles in their way. Um, and when stated in a group environment, either you may have a solution or you may be able to connect them with somebody who has a solution or somebody at the table may have the solution. So um, those are really two important uh, questions that I ask. And the third, third question is, what is one thing that your friends come to you for? Like, is it, you know, un uh, understanding marketing? Is it SEO? Is it you know, human uh, resources and, and company culture. Um, I'm trying to get a clear understanding of, of what they're really good at um, so that other people in the group may be able to to benefit. Right. So those are the three things I use to kind of cap off the dinner. And then after the dinner, I'll usually send like an introduction email amongst everybody. So everybody has each other's contact information and um, kind of go from there. I love it, Jason. This this has been uh, this has been phenomenal. I love those three kind of closing questions. I would imagine if there's six people at the dinner and you're asking all three questions, you should probably give yourself I don't know what thirty 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 five minutes at the end of the dinner to to get kind of give ample time to to each person to respond. Yeah, you can definitely. I mean, it's um, usually it, it'll create a conversation. Oftentimes, like it's, it's amazing how many times somebody says, "Oh, like this is the obstacle in my way to, in order to achieve that said goal," and then somebody says, "Hey, I can help you with that," or "I've, I've achieved that," or "I know somebody who's achieved, achieved that." So it depends on how you want to do the dinner. For me, like if I'm doing a larger dinner and I want to be very cognizant of time, uh, I'll make them just answer the question, and then everybody goes around, and then ultimately at the end of the dinner, you'll see two people, like one person, grab another person aside, um, you know, and. and chat at the bar about, uh, you know, being able to solve their problem, or maybe they want more, they want to leverage that person's expertise, because they said they, you know, they're an expert in cryptocurrency, or whatever the case may be. Um, so it depends on how you want to do it. But uh, it, it, that your core role for as a dinner host is just facilitating and making sure everybody feels, you know, they heard and everybody has an opportunity to, to speak and um, nobody's kind of left out. I love it, Jason. So if somebody listening to this, they want to stay connected with you, they want to learn more about Mastermind Talks or, or your podcast, Community Made, what's the best way for them to, to go about doing all those things? Yeah. So um, for the podcast, it's communitymade.com. And then you can find me on all the, the basic social media platforms. So Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter uh, at Jason Gaynard, J-A-Y-S-O-N-G-A-I-G-N-A-R-D. Love it. Jason, thank you so much for your time today. This has been fantastic and I'm really excited to, to see this one go live. Yeah. I mean, thank you for the interview and also thank you for not only reading the book, but taking action and scheduling six of these dinners. I assure you once, once you get the first few under your belt, it, uh, you'll, you'll, it's, it's an amazing experience. I'm really excited about it. So I appreciate the inspiration. To ensure that you never miss an episode of the B2B Growth Show, subscribe to the show on iTunes or your favorite podcast player. This guarantees that every episode will get delivered directly to your device. If you or someone you know would be an incredible guest for the B2B Growth Show, email me at jonathan at sweetfishmedia.com and let us know. We love connecting with B2B executives, and we love sharing their wisdom and perspective with our audience. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.